Nadzia and Nitya to the stage. Mylita there first, then Nadzia, then Nitya. Mylita, Nadzia, Nitya. There you go. Hi. How are you all? But yeah, come on, nice clap, nice clap. Mylita Arga Williams, CEO of International Upgrad. Nadzia Jabin, HR business leader, UK and Ireland for Infosys. And Dr. Nitya Kempka, affiliate lecturer, director, UK and Global Alliances, Cambridge University. And Parv, ladies, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Nitya, if I could start with you on the back of that wonderful discussion we just had with we'll just say the UK and India educational ministers. These partnerships are so important, aren't they, when it comes to mutual learning, knowledge exchange, long-term cooperation. Can you just speak to us about the larger shifts that are taking place right now when it comes to partnerships in UK-India education? Thanks, Mark, and uh, thank you very much for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, there have been recent developments that are worth harking to. And uh, the first is the geopolitics. So we've had a consecutive succession of conservative prime ministers who have uh, consistently shown a tremendous amount of interest uh, in India and in the partnership with India and the UK. Uh, there's also in recent years a so-called tilt uh, to the Indo-Pacific. So India is a very key strategic partner to the United Kingdom. Um, we've also been negotiating a free trade agreement. It's taken a long time. For those of you who've been following it, many twists and turns. We were talking about it a year ago. It was going to happen, but it hasn't quite happened. Indeed, but COVID slowed it down. But what I'm hearing is it's, you know, there's considerable momentum and political will to get it done. So yeah. that's very encouraging. Uh, there have also been uh, significant changes, I think, in the rules for international students. So up until a couple of years ago, Indian students uh, had to leave right after their degree. So they had a couple of weeks and then they had to leave. Uh, whereas Chinese students, for instance, could stay up to two years. And there's been a lot of concerted campaigning by activists, which has resulted in the post-study work program, which has meant that all students has rationalized rules across the board. All students can now have an option of working for two years, which is great because I think, you know, as a consequence of that, international numbers in the UK have shot up. Mm -hmm. The last figure I read was, you know, there were 118,000 visas granted to uh, Indian citizens and uh, Indian students in the UK which is considerably short up from 30,000 or something just, four, four, just four years ago, which is, I think, phenomenal. Because um, a, a lot of the research has indicated that 70% of Indian students actually, all they want to do is get some work experience, put some pounds in the bank, and then go home. Mm. Um, and, but in, to put this all in perspective, I think recently we've had a bit of bad news, which says that the dependents can no longer be bought by Indian students. Which we were just talking about exactly, with the Secretary of the State. Exactly, the previous uh, panel. And, you know, I think this is a little short-sighted because uh, the higher, higher education, as you know, is the third, third largest uh, sector of export for the UK government. And you, you, you brought up the M word, Mark. And I think, unfortunately, mm. you know, there's a conflation between the whole idea of temporary migration and permanent migration. Students are temporary migrants. Their, their visa is for a fixed period of time. They're here in this country to study and uh, you know, work a couple of years and leave. They're temporary migrants. Permanent migration and illegal, you know, illegal migration, uh, those are completely different categories. I understand it's a politically, a politically very sensitive topic. It's a hot button. It, uh, it reflects uh, you know, in, on, in the ballot box, and politicians are very nervous about that. But I think there's re it's really worth segregating those two concepts because uh, you know, for the UK to attract the best and the brightest, we need to have a conducive environment to have students here. And I think the Office of National Statistics can do a great service to all of us if they're able to disaggregate the visa statistics, to, to disentangle this temporary and permanent uh, you know, visa problem. And I think, um, you know, I understand this political concern, but I think there is a practical solution uh, here to get over this hump. Yeah, I'll well said. I'm glad, we, I'm glad we tackled that. Mylita, private companies, public companies have such a big role to, to play when it comes to providing access to, to education. Tell us about Upgrad. What role are you, what role should and can private companies play in providing such important access to education? First of all, thank you, Mark, for having us at this panel. And it's great to be here with two other awesome ladies. I did hear the Secretary of State talk about uh, the skills gap of, mm. did she say, 80 million by 20, 2030? And yeah. I think that's where companies like us come in. Um, Upgrad is Asia's largest skilling company. Uh, we provide uh, online, pathway, uh, in-person, hybrid certification, you name it. 
uh, any kind of skills gap addressing education uh, that is needed as we see the workforce really, really looking for ways to reskill themselves, upskill themselves, and move forward in their careers. So um, the vision of our founders, it was uh, to provide accessible, affordable education in India. And since then, we've now expanded outside the country which well. is Which is essentially the essence of the National Educational exactly. Program, isn't it? That's what That's India is trying to achieve. That's the yeah. enabler. So if, yes. if you can make education available at affordable prices through providing it online or enabling tools to help students mm. make the jump into higher education, be it a degree or a certification program, you're enabling access to education. That's where we can do it at scale. We have had 10 million learners on Upgrad so far since inception, which wow. is significant, and many, many more um, sort of solutions-driven fixes to this, this challenge. And, and you're sitting next to Natsia, who works for Infosys, of course, which is the world's largest corporate university. The Education Center, 337-acre campus, 400 instructors, 200-plus classrooms. You're doing incredible things. What you essentially do is you're reskilling talent in organizations, aren't you, Natsia? Tell us how that works. That is so exciting, because I know traditionally it would be engineers, but it's changing, isn't it? Thank you, Mark. First of all, uh, thank you for having us. Yes. It's a pleasure. So I work for Emphasis. Um, at the helm of Emphasis, our core foundation is on continuous learning. So at the crux of work, workforce, and workplace, we strongly believe that continuous learning should be the focus. Mm. And therefore, we've built this, like you already said, we have a huge corporate university, world's largest corporate university in Mysore. Mm. So we train about 125,000 people over there. At any given point in time, we can train 14,000 employees on a single day. And we've got about 400 in instructors across the world training these people. And with respect to the UK, we've got a program called UK Graduate Program, where we hire graduates from across universities. We train them for about three months. And the beauty of this program is it's not just about technological skills. It's also about non-technology skills. Yeah. So we hire people from both the backgrounds. We, we provide robust training for them in the organization before they deploy it into the project. So we're giving opportunities for people from arts or people from commerce background, any background they can come from. If they're interested in technology, we train them. And that was not, not the case in the past. So we've really- When did that evolved. shift happen? It used think, to be just engineers, engineers. Yes. When did it Probably happen? In the last 10 years, it's yeah. drastically shifted. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this momentum of bringing people in from different backgrounds gives a huge opportunity for them. So we have this platform called Lex, which is our internal platform. Mm which is readily accessible from anywhere, anytime. Even on my mobile, it's accessible. And I can have access to around 8,000 courses. So I can pick from management to Python skills. It's completely up to uh, the individual to learn and upskill themselves. Now, as an organization, we also believe in rewarding people who learn. So we have something called a digital skills program. So as, as, as I, mean, like, I think people have spoken about AI and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So if I'm registered on any program which is relevant to me, and if I clear that, I'm given a digital skill tag. And therefore, my digital quotient increases. And then I can compare myself to the rest of the peer community in terms of where I stand. I think that's a huge future ahead where we're trying to you know, build in this culture where employees can learn continuously. Yeah. yeah and I, I think that's really, sorry to interject do, yeah. there, but that really speaks to this movement away from necessarily degrees. Yes, absolutely. Where skills matter more. Yes. I mean, you could have a degree in computer engineering 10 years ago, and you might be entirely irrelevant today. So if you don't add skills badges to your capabilities, you, you are likely to be left behind. Has the mindset changed? I mean, I'm a bit older. I feel, I feel a bit older. But in, our, in my day, it was, ed, you, know, you finish university and you're done. Clearly, that is not the case now well, H have have the the, the generation oh, excuse me has generation X adapted to this? Gen Z has adapted to this. Gen yes. Z lives it. Yeah, yeah obviously, it. but the older yeah. generations yeah. have they adapted? Sort this of. is our this is yes. our key audience. Yes, it's fo folks in their forties, fifties yeah. now up to. We have students who are seventy. Well, also I think if you think about it, life expectancy has increased manifold, and Absolutely. so we should stop thinking of education as something you finish by the time you're twenty-one. Yeah. It's a lifelong process, you know, life expectancy is increased in the Western world in, in well into the 90s. And we really need to begin to think of this differently, mm. lifelong learning.
And yeah. these days, the organizations, are, they have different career tracks, career paths, where people can move from one career path to another. So gone are these days where we are stuck into one stream. So people can move. So. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm a good example of it. I spent 25 years in the media industry, and I'm now in education and technology. You can just switch. Yes. It's I wonderful. Don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, you, you, you're doing a good job. Let's come back to the national educational policy, if we can, uh, Nitya. Um, one of the big aspects of that is creating the provision for foreign universities to establish campuses in, in India. I mean, this, this is huge. It's, it's a game changer, isn't it? Can you speak of the challenges, the opportunities on that and when it comes to the, to, to the new educational policy front? Mark, yes, you're absolutely right. It is a game changer. And I think intercultural education, you know, um, intercultural exchange can really lead to creativity and innovation. Um, and I think, you know, the whole idea of India becoming a global study destination, as Mylita said, it would solve problems of access. It would enable Indian students to access higher education. It would conserve foreign exchange reser reserves. It would incentivize uh, local institutions to innovate. Um, but yes, it's not without challenges, you know, setting up a new campus abroad or in India, it would require land, it would require, uh, you know, training of staff, it, re it would require professors who can commit to spending some time in another country. Mm -hmm. All of those are challenges. I think there is a halfway house, you know, I think UK institutions can tie up with well-established Indian institutes. Uh, and then they can, you know, perhaps consider joint degrees or, you know, professors teaching in, in, in both uh, geographies. That, that, that's definitely something to be explored and people are beginning to explore it. Uh, but I think uh, it's, it's not going to be completely easy. But what I want to also bring to our attention is there's an enormous imbalance between the number of students, Indian students coming to the UK, and the number of UK students going, uh, going into India. And I think that should change. It's an area, I think, of huge opportunity. And it's really where you've got transformative power. If we're talking about soft power, uh, both from an Indian and UK perspective, it can only happen through education, through culture, to exchange, through understanding. Um, and I think, you know, for example, the Turing scheme, which is a wonderful scheme, mm. the, uh, the, the government of the United Kingdom, which funds uh, students in England or in the, in the UK, sorry, to study abroad. I think that's such a great scheme. Um, unfortunately, India is quite low down in the hierarchy of places that students in the UK would like to go to. It's only the 10th highest. And I think there's huge potential to explore uh, that relationship. And I think, you know, there's a human benefit with in intercultural uh, exchange. So how can we get India from 10th further up the league table? Whose job is it? Is, whose job is it? Well, I think it's the UK's job, I think, to, you know, to, to make it, to, to communicate better that India is a, is, is a great destination. I think from, there's, there is more uncertainty in the UK about India than there is about India and the UK, because I think the, uh, India is, is very, very uh, sure that the, it sees UK as a very useful partner, particularly in the education arena. It's very committed to doing uh, the, the free trade agreement. Uh, and I think, you know, with this new education policy, I think the, the getting the fundamentals right in terms of incentivizing uh, students from abroad to come to India, Indian universities to uh, open up abroad, you know, it's a huge revolution that's happening in, in India right now, the digital stack, which everybody is talking mm. about in India now, you know, creating this unified software uh, platform, which, you know, emphasis yes. is right at the yes. center of. Um, I think, you know, this digitization of daily life is really worth seeing, Mark. If you go to India now, you can literally buy uh, uh, off a vegetable seller on the street uh, vegetables with a QR code. You know, so huge numbers of people are entering the digital age in India. Um, the, India is also the second largest investor in the UK after the United States, which not many people know about. So I think when we talk about this living bridge, uh, you know, I think education opportunity, um, you know, this true cultural exchange between uh, the two countries can go a long way in in, in building that bridge and keeping the relationship. Yeah. So I completely Please. agree with her. I mean, in terms, in terms of this cultural exchange, I think Infosys has a program called InStep, where we bring students from across the world, US, Europe, name it, all countries, and we basically take them to India. They, we train them in India in the Mysore campus. Mm. They're there for about three to six months, and then we place them back into different projects across the world. So I think it's a wonderful exchange happening between uh, India and other countries. So I think that that's something that, you know, maybe organizations can well on in terms of providing this approach. I have yeah. a slightly different point of view. I yeah. think Indian institutions can do a much better job of making themselves open and welcoming to international How? students. Um, it, firstly, it is so competitive at the top Indian, certainly technolo technology uh, universities, um, and there aren't as many options in non-technology fields. 
So the, 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 the bar is high. Mm. You know, a, a super smart Indian uh, engineer might prefer to go to an IIT than to study mm. in the UK. Uh, so how, do, how does that attract also the top students from the UK or other developed markets? Mm. Uh, I think that's something that we've yet to work out. Yeah. To yeah. my latest point, there was a recent survey that looked at you know Indian students and how they were aware, how much they were aware of life in the UK. And 74% of Indian kids knew exactly what the culture of the United Kingdom was. Like, uh, only 21% of United uh, students in the UK knew exactly what life in India was. So I think we can really do a lot in, in, in increasing that confidence and the awareness of each other's culture. Can what, I move? Sorry. What, yeah. Just quickly, yeah, yeah, yeah. one of the ways that we're looking at that and innovating in that space at Upgrad is creating pathway programs. Mm. So where you can do a one-year diploma in your home country or in one on, online with one of our programs and then spend the second year mm. on a campus in, in a sort of integrated set of campuses that we are setting up across the globe. Uh, to complete your degree, and that would give students that ability to make those choices, yeah. whether they're from India or to India, because that just makes it that much uh, less resistance to the move. Can, can I come back to AI, which we discussed in the, the prior discussion with the Secretary of State and the Minister of Education? Gen AI, it's, it's such a big thing, isn't it? And I know that companies like all yes, you two are yes. taking huge steps to to use AI and adapt it and embed it into what you're offering. So how are you both using AI? How are you approaching AI to incorporate it into new skills for the future? Sure, I can start. We, we're doing it on, on two fronts. Uh, within the uh, course curriculum that we are currently teaching, we've incorporated AI to enable learning. So we do career uh, coaching through AI, so while you're doing your online degree, you can on the side interview for a job and get some coaching. Uh, we do uh, grading assignments through AI if they're you know, quant and not written uh, responses. Uh, and we have job interview tools. So that's where we, we are so far with more to come. On the other side, we're introducing courses to enable, for instance, we have um, a doctorate in business administration in emerging technologies. So, because generative AI will change every few months, right? The technology is so fast. What you want to give people is the tools to adapt to the changing technology, to allow them to be skilled at skilling up. Uh, so so we're, we, we're launching a new program and we will have more to come specifically. That's a great t-shirt, skilled at skilling up. Should we? <laughs> We can brand it. Split it? 50-50? Yeah. Do I get 50? It's your idea. But we can make it a collaboration. Okay. And we'll give, we'll give all of it to most of it. No, most yeah. of it to charity. And yeah. yeah. It can We're be a commercial a, company. We are. Yeah, that, that's, it's true, actually. I love that. Sorry, I interrupted you. Was no, that was it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so just to add on to her, we, like I mentioned, we have a thing called Lex, which is an internal learning platform, which is available for all our employees within the organization. Mm. We have around 8,000 courses over there. So we have uh, digital skill tags, we have digital quotient, and so on and so forth. But Mark, what I also wanted to draw was, during the pandemic, as an organization, we decided that this learning platform should be made available to the local bodies, to the NGOs, to yeah. the councils. And that's where we created an external platform called yeah. Springboard. Springboard. Mm -hmm. So there's Lex, which is the online Springboard, Springboard external. external. Tell us about that. Yeah. And we basically gave this platform at no cost to all the NGOs and councils. And in the UK, we're very happy to tell you that we partnered with Brent Council and Sandville Council uh, and we, we basically give this platform to those students and to those SMEs who are in need. And we've got about 50,000 US users who are registered as on today. So that's, that's a huge shift again. And our aim is to take this to as many councils as possible within the UK and to all the NGO bodies who are in need of this platform. And 8,000 courses are over there and 50,000 users who are using about 200 courses. And all of this is available at the click of your mobile. It's mm. as easy as that. So we're getting a lot of traction on that field and we have a separate department. In fact, my colleagues are seated over here. They, they only take care of this and we want to bring the springboard to as many councils as possible. Mark, and you know, I think human beings are not going to go anywhere, but we need to train humans to be the prompt engineers for generative AI. Yeah. So they need to be trained to ask the right questions um, and to direct AI so that it can be a force for good. 
And I think there's a lot of potential in that and asking the right question and, and directing it and really being on top of it. So. Ladies, we've got one minute each, so I think I'm going to give you 20 seconds each to reach out to our audience, a sort of an inspiring call to action, final word, whatever you want when it comes to your thoughts, education, the collaboration. 20 seconds each. I'll just go left to right if you're facing the stage. So 20 seconds, go. All, all I would say is that uh, it's never too late to stop learning. Um, find the skills that you want to plug uh, gaps with, gaps you want to plug with skills, yeah. and get learning. Yeah, get learning. That's it. I'm sure from this audience, a lot of you are from educational institutions, from the government body. So my urge to you is we want to give back. So please uh, go to emphasis.com, look at this thing called Springboard. If any of you want to reach out or get in touch with us, please do will very happily take this entire platform to wherever is required. And trust me, it is it's extremely good. And like the Secretary of State mentioned, we yeah. have a huge uh, skill gap. And I, I seriously think this can bridge that gap. And please do approach our guests if you're physical, as in if you're a physical audience here in front of us, please do approach our guests afterwards. Virtual, you know where to find them. No Upgrad, pressure. Upgrad.com. Upgrad.com. No pressure, Nitya. This is it. The I final know. words. I think intercultural exchange can really lead to innovation, to creativity, and through true partnership. And I, I think like the, the living bridge is a living bridge for re reason. We need to invest in it. We need to uh, invest in partnerships in education and intercultural exchange. Just before I thank our guests, up next, we're going to have a little 30-second break. We're going to have an embracing technology session. Edie is going to be chatting to Jonathan Ashworth, Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. That's next. Don't you dare go anywhere, else I'll chase after you. Thanks to Mylita. Thanks to Natsia. Thanks to Nitya. Big thank round of applause. So thank you so much. much.